Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today at ISC 2021. I'm so thrilled to have Michelle and Oscar, Oscar here with us to tell the stories of how they've made it through this crazy last year. Just as all of you have been fighting the many challenges, they're specifically going to talk about what they've been doing to address the digital divide. So my name is Suzanne Phillips, and I'm a part of our global education team here at Cisco, where I get to hang out with teachers from around the world and figure out how we can help them through technology to keep their students connected and engaged. So you're probably noticing that today, different from the other ISTE sessions, we're joining in on the WebEx platform because we wanted to have more of an engaging, interactive session where we could talk to you. So you can see right now, if you want to turn on your video, we'd, we'd love to see your faces and have an active conversation. Uh, you can see I'm, sh I'm showing what I see right now. We've got our list of participants on the side. Just as I'm getting started, I pressed, I wanted to press mute all so that everybody, you know, we can have a clean introduction, but then feel free, I've said it so that you can come off mute at any time if you want to ask a question or chime in. Uh, we like to have kind of a collaborative conversation here, and then we'll be using chat in order to facilitate extra questions and commentary too as we go. Right now, you're seeing people are sharing where they're from, what they do. We'd love to know who you are so we can drive where the conversation will go. And then another feature I like to show off is down here, you'll see the smiley face for our reactions. This way we can give positive feedback to our speakers. So you'll see if I turn on this right here with the recognized hand gestures, I can actually give a physical thumbs up and it'll register a thumbs up on WebEx so they can know, yeah, I'm following. We're right there with you. Tony, I'm gonna mute you. We started getting a little background. Okay, but there we go. So with that, um, I also wanna just share, before we get started, I wanna invite you to our other ISTE sessions that we have coming up this week. So, I see some familiar faces that I've already seen in sessions with us because well, there's a couple of folks who are looking to get one of these sweet Cisco Igloo mugs. So for folks who join three sessions, we'll mail you a mug in the mail. And then we will also put you in for a raffle to win a pair of AirPods. So today we're at the second session in the day here at Mind the Gap using technology to bridge the digital divide with um, Oscar Rico from Canatea School District and Michelle Bourgeois from St. Vrain Valley. You can see we have a couple other sessions that are here in green where we're having teachers or education leaders directly from their school system talk about their experience. In blue, we've got some great sessions coming up with Cisco folks sharing the latest features and resources to help you get started. And then in yellow, we've got a learning partner coming up where we'll talk about connecting with multilingual families. So feel free to screenshot this, or if you forget it, just come by the Cisco booth at ISTE where you can see the resources to join us for more. Okay, and with that, I'd love to invite Tony. Would you introduce our esteemed panelists today? Absolutely. Hello, everyone. My name is Tony Davis, and I work at Cisco in global communications. I don't have to tell anyone in this group that during the pandemic, the gap between those folks in both economics and geography really was a challenge for school districts as they wanted to keep teachers teaching, administrators working, and most importantly, students learning. And what we have here today are just two absolutely amazing folks who are going to uh, warm your heart and inspire you with their stories of true education resilience. Um, first up, we will listen to the story of Dr. Oscar Rico and the Canateo School District from Texas. And um, then we will turn to Miss Michelle Bourgeois from the St. Vrain Valley Schools. And I'm just thrilled to have you um, hear their stories. Afterwards, we'll have a little chat and then we'd love to hear your questions because there are so many lessons learned here and um, happy to kick it off. Um, Dr. Rico, if you wouldn't mind going first and Pamela putting up um, the slide of his school district, that would be amazing. Um, not only is the Canateo Independent School District and their accomplishments amazing, Dr. Rico, if you wouldn't mind telling a little bit of your personal story because it is so inspirational to folks um, during this time. And I think what everyone's looking for right now is just a little hope in addition to all of the great education outcomes. Thank you, Tony. I really appreciate it. And then thank you all for, for coming to this session as well. I think most of us that are working in education uh, during this pandemic 
we were able to recognize a couple of things, right? Number one, schools are so vital for our society to continue to operate and, and for everybody to really um, to continue the day to day. And as we transitioned into a more remote learning for just about everybody in the country, the value that we place into educational technology and IT as a whole really was exemplified. You know, and that's something that we have talked about um, throughout the sessions that, that, we, that we've seen and, and just the importance of having a network that supports student learning. And just like Tony was saying, uh, as we started into this pandemic, I remember clearly, you know, like m many of us just getting the, the news of, okay, you know, it's going to be a temporary shutdown. We're going to try and figure out how we are going to transition into a different type of learning. And everybody started putting a number to it, right? We heard anything from two weeks. We're going to take two weeks of spring break, which was unheard of for us. You know, it was two weeks of a no travel spring break and a very different spring break, right? So I remember my kids at home thinking, right, more vacation, but it wasn't the vacation they were expecting, right? And nobody could have ever forecasted that we were going to be here ending the school year for the following year, still under these conditions. So I work for a very visionary leader. And when, when it came time to transition into a remote learning environment, the common opinion around us was that we were going to perhaps take a month or so to figure things out and then come back into into uh, classrooms and that wasn't the case but one of the things that really became a topic of conversation and really why i subscribe to the leadership here in my district is it doesn't matter when we come back or what we do when we get back things have to be better right? we have to emerge from this better we have to really identify things that are going on in our community and work together to come up with a solution. And like Tony was saying, I, I grew up here in El Paso, right? And, and El Paso is very diverse. And then the district that we serve here in Canotillo is very diverse. You're able to see kids with that live in homes in some of the highest property values in our city. And then some others that are living in multiple uh, family households and do not have access to even the most essential of services. So we are having to serve both student communities. And then we understood when, when kids went back into remote learning that things were different. Um, we started repurposing machines that were, you give it a number, 10, 12, 8 years old, and we hadn't turned them on in such a long time that we didn't really know if these things worked or not. Um, we started also to see that connectivity was mostly from mobile devices. Right? We have mobile providers, and there was a parent in the household that had a hotspot and maybe three or four siblings that were utilizing that hotspot when mom or dad got home to on a mad rush to, to complete assignments. And that's just not something that we knew was going to work. So coming from, from my beginnings here in El Paso, I grew up in, in subsidized housing here or government housing. And then we really understood the reality was very different when the social capital is not there, right? And for me, what kept me up at night was that there was going to be children in that same environment, right? That just like I grew up in the projects across the street and didn't have access to, to the best um, social capital available that would allow me to, to really uh, succeed in the educational system, I knew that was going to happen for a lot of my, my kiddos too. And um, so as we devised a plan, we knew we needed two things. We needed a device in kids' hands that was reliable, and we needed to have a connectivity solution that was going to, to provide for, for students to learn. And you see here, we have um, over 6,000 students. And, and the thing is, again, we're split in those demographics. So we're trying to figure in this mad dash in, in March, what are we going to do? Uh, there were several promotions from ISPs you know, and, and ethically they wanted to provide services for students and um, telling us that the promise was there for at least three months, right, to provide free internet service, free reliable internet service for our kids, which we thought was great. We mobilized with our uh, parent liaisons, our school district has one per campus, and then try to figure, hey, let's get everybody signed up for this solution and let's get everybody with free internet. Well, we quickly encountered that when disposable income is not available in those neighborhoods, the fiber footprint is not there, right? And the infrastructure footprint is not there. So although we had an opportunity to have kids provided for with free internet services, just the infrastructure wasn't there, right? And um, having grown up in those conditions, I know that it was 
it is difficult right? when you don't have the right support to to do your homework when we don't have the right support for for success in schools and if we go on here to the next slide you, you're going to start to see now the predicament that we were in right? we were in this in this right that what are we going to do as we move from the physical classroom into a distance learning environment with kids connecting after 5 6 p.m to our asynchronous learning through a hotspot and that hotspot would take 30 minutes to an hour to download work and then to be able to place it on there. Um, we here in the state subscribe to it an attendance policy where as long as you uploaded your work within that day, you were present, right? I think we've neglected to see what was behind that solution, right? That kids would have to stay up from five o'clock in the afternoon to midnight, just trying to get something done, just trying to be counted present. Um, when we fail to be socially responsible, I think we start losing kids in, in, in the translation of services. You know, I, I had a parent who would work 12 hour shifts just to support us and to put food on the table. So if you had to tell my mother to be involved in school during this pandemic, it probably would have meant that when she got home at midnight, we were connecting, right? And because assignments weren't there until in the school day the next day, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, whatever it is, we would have a very minute, um, window of time to to really produce anything, right? And I think at that time, I don't know if you'll agree with me, but we were just in completion mode, right? We, we didn't really start looking at the value of the instructional process as to how we were training teachers to be uh, great online teachers. We were just focusing on finishing out the year, closing out, and we would work on on the instructional techniques as it came through. Again, with, with the vision of my district uh, leadership and my school board, we started really investing into these areas of, of having professional development, having an infrastructure that was going to help uh, kids be successful, thinking that even if this pandemic was over by the start of this school year, over in terms that we would have kids back in school, that we would still have kids that are under service, you know, and we would still have kids that do not have access <laughs> to the information gateway that, that is going to provide further education. That's when we started looking as to what are we going to do as a school district to solve this divide, right? Because we're gonna have huge gaps. We already knew that gaps were going to occur because kids were not accustomed to this method of learning. So we started to call different ISPs and call different vendors. I got the same response from anybody that we talked to, right? We started looking at um, LTE solutions. We started looking at everything under the rainbow that was going to, to provide for this. But in more instances, when you only have 6,000 kids, your buying power is limited, right? I am not going to buy in the millions and millions of dollars that some of the major districts in Texas are. And also I was now fighting the private uh, industry that also had millions of dollars to transition their office spaces from a physical to a remote environment. We got disillusioned pretty quick to see that our proposal of becoming an ISP was laughed at from many different sites, right? So we met with different vendors, local, you know, state, out of state. We just said, this is insane. You know, and, and, and why are you going to spend all of this money for something that is just going to be over in the summer anyway? Well, things were not gonna be over in the summer as we would find out later. Uh, gaps were going to continue to get worse. And even now, as we start to recover, as a district, we subscribe to the sense that we're not going to fill gaps, we're going to accelerate learning. But to accelerate learning is going to require technology tools. If we had not taken the time to really define what our infrastructure was going to look like and what solution we were going to provide for our kids, the efforts that we're making as a district were going to be um, shortcutted because of that solution. So. As I started looking, we had devices now in kids' hands and we started looking for connectivity solutions, knowing that these hotspots were not going to provide for students what they needed. And I was probably at my last call when I spoke to, to a local representative and said, look, man, I, I don't know what else to do, right? We've, we've, it hasn't even been a question about the money because nobody has even asked about how much money we want to spend on this. They just say, no, and this is insane. So he kind of regrouped and said, okay, let me make one more connection for you. And I remember that question. And if you've heard it from that uh, podcast, that one question was always, 
I just need somebody who is as crazy as I am, or no, you know, scratch that, half as crazy as I am, because we need somebody with that type of vision and mentality to get us to where we need to be. So he laughed and connected me to my local Cisco rep and, and, and promised to deliver somebody who was as crazy as I was, or even more crazy than I was, right? So um, when we started bringing them to the table, again, I was never asked about price. I was never asked about investment. I did start to see something different, right? I'd started to see titles on, on meeting invites, an engineer for this, an architect for the other. We now had meetings with every person available to create the solution. And again, we have 6,000 kits, right? Um, we started looking at the solution that was being utilized across the world to prevent high-speed trains from crashing into each other, right? So they were now meshing their, te their technology from train to train to prevent this and at a rather successful rate, right? And for me, it was a preventing of a crashing of a student's education. So it was even more valuable to me uh, to get to what we were doing. So we started to switch into creating a mesh solution in which we were going to be sending out internet signals from our schools into the community via a, an ultra reliable backhaul solution that uh, Cisco had acquired from, from this other company. And from that moment on, I never felt alone. Uh, the pandemic start was rather difficult. Um, a little bit about my biography. I have a degree in microbiology and um, came into education thinking I was going to do one year or two as the job market stabilized. And then I would go and to do whatever I thought a microbiologist would do. Um, but, you know, I, the one to two years of teaching became nine years of teaching. And then further on now, 18 years into this, have have transitioned into now being an IT professional without any formal IT training, right? So my doctorate degree is not in IT. My teaching was not in IT. I was a middle school principal. So to take this job in March 2020 was just a roller coaster ride. And not having the people there to provide the support made it even more difficult. So having somebody willing to go above and beyond, as uh, Cisco did, to provide the solution for our students, that is not just going to remediate the now, right? Every, every time I thought about the, the providing of internet for kids, I understand that with that comes also the understanding that you're providing an education. And not just now when schools are virtual, but in the future. I think um, technology used to be the, the glue that held everything together, right? That's what we were promised as a slogan to being the foundation that just holds everything. If you and I have an outage for, and we were discussing this earlier, for two minutes, it seems like an eternity for everybody, right? It seems like they want to come, I have to close my door to, to not be hanged from the top of, of the ceiling just because everybody becomes so reliable on on the foundation that is IT. So, so with, with that said, um, we are now in the, in the final stages of, of this process where we're going to be able to provide the same solution for kids at their home, right? And then they'll be able to come out in, in, in their front yard and be able to have that same connectivity and same solution that they have here in schools, that same, that same connection speeds. And to me, that's a win, right? Because I know I know as a young child, I, I needed every advantage possible to be successful. And it wasn't until very later in life and during college that I was able to start finding these connections, right? If, if I had followed the pathway that I was in at my high school, I would probably be a great plumber right now because that's the only presentations that we would get, right? They would look at where you lived and when it said uh, apartment 130 or apartment 140 and they saw the complex, they knew where we were coming from. And then, you know, not to blame anybody, I think they were trying to provide great solutions but um, for me, being able to provide this IT solution for kids means that I'm not going to limit them by whatever their zip code says, by whatever their apartment complex says. They are going, only going to be limited by their own capabilities. And to me, yeah, that's something that when I go six feet under, you can put on my, on my gravestone that we were able to provide that platform for kids to be successful. Well, Dr. Rico, thank you so much for that. We definitely appreciate that. 
and continuing on the theme of geography as to where you're from and who's in your fantastic school district, I am thrilled to have Michelle Bourgeois from the Chief Technology Officer of the St. Rain Valley Schools talk about her geographically diverse district and how they kept students learning um, with WebEx as well as how they helped close that digital divide. Michelle? Oh, Michelle, I think you're on mute. I won the bingo board of muting today. How's that? It happens to everyone one, <laughs> at least one time a day. Take it away, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much. Hey, I was going to say, I want to go back to something that Dr. Rico said, because I think a lot of us can can empathize with the word he used. It felt a little crazy this year to do what school districts had to do. Um, and, you know, when I think about that, that level of, of commitment that it took for, for his district to do, um, I just so appreciate the uncompromising eye on equity that he kept at the forefront of his work. And so... Um, I'm, I'm inspired every time I hear him speak. And I want to say, too, that uh, we do have something in common that I didn't recognize. I started as a microbiology major, too, uh, and then went into education. So uh, small worlds is what we get to live in, which is pretty amazing. Um, so to share a little bit about St. Grain Valley School District, we're about an hour north of Denver here in Colorado. We are the seventh largest district in the state. Um, and I have the good fortune of serving 33,000 students and about 5,000 employees, about 2,000 of which are uh, teachers in our district. Um, and as Tony alluded to, um, we had the, the unique opportunity to think about not just economic challenges with about a third of our students uh, coming from households where there are economic challenges uh, and a third of our students who speak uh, Spanish as a second language. Um, but also thinking about a geographic challenge. So if you've ever been to Colorado, you know that we have these things called mountains. Uh, and we live uh, in a district which covers about 411 square miles. We go from the foothills just outside of Rocky Mountain National Park all the way out to the eastern plains. And so for us, um, you know, we, we use the word uh, geographically challenged, and it really means something here because when you live in the middle of a canyon, um, it's not just about making sure you have uh, accessible internet and opportunities for your kids who are, uh, you know, in the middle of a city that's dense and has those opportunities, but it's also the kids who are living in places where uh, it's just, it's impossible to find a way to provide a, a solution. Uh, and so I want to give us two words to think about. You know, one word that came up a lot this year for all of us was pivot. Um, and I think about, when I think about basketball and I think about pivot, you know, you have one foot stable, and you know that other foot is kind of moving around to figure out where where that next focus needs to be. It, sometimes it felt like a pivot. Sometimes it felt a little more than uh, a pivot, more like a scramble. Um, but instead of pivot, I want us to think about the word reimagine today, because you know that's what we got to do this year in education was not just pivot to meet the needs that were thrown at us sometimes randomly in the middle of the night but to reimagine what learning could be. Um, and I really want uh, St. Brain to come out of this, this COVID adventure that we got to have better than we were before. And I know that a lot of you share that same uh, goal with me. Uh, we had the good fortune in St. Brain when we started uh, in this adventure uh, to having a mobile learning solution in place in terms of devices. So our students in grades six through 12 uh, had devices that went home with them daily. Our students in grades K through five um, had devices that stayed in the classroom. So, so I feel like we were pre-positioned pretty well in St. Brain to take care of that. But what we didn't have um, was connectedness. And that's the first thing that we had to reimagine here. Uh, and it meant for us a pivot from thinking of our schools um, and inside the walls of our schools being the place that connectivity happens, um, but thinking about outside the walls. How are we going to provide connectedness for our students uh, when our buildings are closed. Um, and so for us, uh, as Dr. Rico said, uh, we had 10 days. Uh, we, we learned on a Wednesday evening, I came into our district uh, for a meeting to learn that we might be closing. And the next morning I got up and got the announcement that, that our public health departments were recommending that we close. And so we went from uh, thinking we'd have a little bit of a runway to having 10 days as we were out on spring break uh, to think about how we were going to solve this challenge and reimagine how we helped our students connect. 
Uh, and so what we ended up doing uh, was spending those 10 days in partnership with Cisco, um, thinking about outdoor access points. And so in each of our regions, um, we placed uh, an outdoor access point that provided our students with connectivity because uh, whilst many of our students lived within walking distance of our schools, as I said, uh, geographic challenges meant that some of us, me included, uh, live in places where satellite internet was the best option that we had. Um, and that's just not adequate for us to really think about supporting students uh, in their learning. And so for us, playgrounds and parking lots became centers of learning. And so I would many days drive uh, out of the canyon that I live in uh, and wave to parents who were sitting in lawn chairs with their kids or sitting in their cars with their kids as we all connected to you know, district resources and learning to, to get the job done. Uh, and so for us, it was really thinking about um, not just during COVID, but how can we um, leverage that moving forward? And so um, those hot outdoor access points are still there and they're still used for outdoor learning. So we see kids, even as we're coming back into schools, um, sitting out on the playgrounds and the parking lots in the summer, reading books, downloading resources, uh, and still leveraging that. Um, we also have the good fortune of working with our city uh, for a portion of our district. The city of Longmont has a, a wireless solution. And so we're working with them, much as Dr. Rico is, to think about how we can expand their fiber network that extends through our city out to our students um, by creating a wireless mesh network uh, that will support all of our students in need. Um, and so that's a really exciting for us uh, to think about how we can continue to extend that learning. Um, second one. Um, challenge it, it was uh, thinking about how we uh, make sure that we keep our communities active because as we all know, uh, learning is as much about the connections we make uh, as it is about the content that we teach. Uh, and so for us that reimagining community meant that we had to pivot from in person being the way and the, the method in which teachers instructed students uh, to virtual learning and blended learning. Uh, we had a, a cadre of coaches and technology coordinators who had been working uh, to start thinking about what blended learning could look like. Uh, boy, did that get ramped up <laughs> as we got started. Uh, so for us, uh, WebEx was a tool we had just adopted uh, just uh, about a year before. And we were ambitious in thinking that we would take a slow, slow roll. And over 18 months, we get teachers trained and we get our district staff trained and everyone would just, you know, in a year and a half, we would all be ready for WebEx. Uh, 10 days later, uh, we recognized that we had 10 days to get everyone uh, not just ready, but but just you know eager to, to lean into these tools. So we went from a slow roll uh, to a very deep dive. Uh, and amazingly, our coaches and our coordinators stepped up to the challenge. Um, and we taught teachers how to use WebEx on WebEx. Uh, and so our coaches would teach courses uh, in the afternoons and during the day as those 10 days of getting ready uh, carried us forward. Uh, you know, how do you connect and create community in a math classroom using WebEx? How do you do that in a language arts classroom? So they really focus teachers on thinking about not just their content and content delivery, but also building those connections with students. Um, and so for us, we went from a couple of dozen meetings a week uh, to about 100,000 a month uh, as every teacher in every department started to leverage this tool. Um, we also heard from our, our teachers as we were just getting started and thinking this out is, um, with the challenge they recognize for their secretaries in, in district offices and school offices, as well as in their classrooms, like, I like to call home. Um, I prefer not to call home on my cell phone because once that cat's out the bag, uh, my life becomes uh, connected to my cell phone with my families. So how might you give us that, that uh, opportunity to make those phone calls? And so uh, our team uh, implemented Teams Calling uh, so we linked our Cisco IP phones into our Teams calling solution. So when you picked up and dialed an extension using Teams, it rang the extension just as if that person were sitting at their desk. Uh, and so it kept those connections to our families and to our community and to our departments uh, active and going with a way that people didn't even know, like, am I sitting at my desk or am I sitting at home? Doesn't matter. That connection was happening and it gave our teachers the opportunity to call out and call families. Uh, because for some families, that was the most effective way to make that connection. So reimagining community um, and making sure we pivoted to those virtual learning and those virtual connections that we needed to make. Um, great story that I can share with you because I, I know you guys probably all felt this too. Six-year-olds who were kindergartners 
had never seen their teacher. Like for them, school is this. School is a bunch of people sitting on a screen uh, and figuring out uh, how they uh, how they make those relationships happen. And so as we were starting to come back into hybrid, one teacher told me the story that she had one of her kindergarten students uh, invite her to a soccer game uh, as we were starting to come back to in-person events. Uh, and so she excitedly told the student, yes, I'll be there on Saturday. And she got there and she went up to the student and said, hello, you know, I'm so excited to, you know, to see you here and see you play. And the student's like, who are you? Uh, <laughs> because they had never seen one another in person. So it's a recognition that we're building those connections. And sometimes our little ones uh, are learning new ways to connect uh, that we had never had to do before. Um, so it was fun to see how our kids and our teachers started to make that, that work. Last one that, that I want to uh, think about with you is reimagining security, um, because as we know, um, COVID brought a lot of challenges that we had to solve pretty quickly. Um, and for us, it was a pivot to always on protection. Prior to COVID, uh, content filtering happened on an on-premise device on our on-premise network. Uh, and so we, as we started thinking about what it meant to have students uh, going home with devices and learning on devices 24-7, 365, uh, thinking about how we made sure that we were keeping those students safe and helping them focus on their learning. Uh, so we went from an on-network, uh, on-premise solution uh, to Umbrella, Cisco solution for filtering. Uh, and for me, the success uh, in thinking about moving our cybersecurity to a place where, uh, you know, it, it happens on the device regardless of where the device is, was when we got no feedback, um, except for one student who said, man, for some reason I can't use Netflix anymore on my district iPad. Yay. Uh, and so for us, um, moving to that on, uh, on uh, excuse me, off district uh, protection that, that traveled with a student meant that we could go into conversations with parents confident that we were giving our families the success and the solutions that they needed uh, to be able to, uh, to know that learning was happening, even while they were trying to scramble uh, their work and their commitments, uh, they knew that their students were able to do their, their learning and focus on keeping them safe. Um, we also knew that we had to think about our employees and our staff because we were sending them home um, with laptops and resources that uh, we scrambled up to make sure that they could continue to work from home. Uh, so as part of our security solution, um, Umbrella was a piece of, but, but also uh, Cisco AMP. So making sure that our endpoint protection on all of our devices was also ready uh, to think about, you know, what happens when finance goes home and they're trying to process paychecks and payroll uh, on a home network? How can we ensure um, that, that I'm going to get my paycheck at the end of the month uh, because their devices are protected and ready. So between filtering and endpoint protection, uh, we felt like we um, we hit the, the ball out of the park in terms of making sure that, that work went on, that learning went on. Um, and, you know, in conclusion, I think it was really, I'm proud of the work that our team did, um, the nights that they spent brainstorming all of these solutions because we came out of COVID more resilient as a department and a district and able to, to pivot, uh, as we use that word again, um, into solutions that just that make us more resilient, more robust and, and provide more opportunities for our students. Um, and we're coming out of this with some solutions that will carry forward. So as many of you did, we had a remote school uh, that served uh, almost 10 percent of our staff uh, our students this year. Um, and we have about 350 students who are going to continue in that remote environment. So for us, thinking about those geographic challenges that we're coming out of this with, um, our students who are in the foothills who wanted to take the one AP European history course that's, teach, that's taught in the Plains schools, um, they can now. Um, we've got the tools, the resources, and the connections uh, so that our students' opportunities are just expanded uh, exponentially because of this. Um, so thinking about, uh, I hope you guys are doing the same, thinking about not just pivoting, but how we can reimagine how we serve our students, how we serve our community, and how we make sure they're ready for the future is something that I'm just I'm excited to see how we keep moving forward. Michelle, thank you so much for sharing that story. Um, moving on to one or two questions um, before our session ends. Dr. Rico, can you please talk about 
the one or two best practices that you would tell folks about how they can really power an inclusive recovery for schools? So the best practice for, for us that we've seen, and it, it's provided me a good platform, having come from a uh, classroom educator experience is thinking about the hardware and really think about the end user. Right, and I think, as I talk to to my peers uh, that they carry out this job around the region, we become so engulfed in in the hardware, right, and everything that, that works on our side. But uh, we we consistently joke about you know that 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 problem layer that is between the keyboard and the chair. And I think one of the best practices that we were able to see, uh, Tony, is that when we keep in mind that at the end of the day, it's the end user who is going to have that experience, we reverse engineer it from there, right? So we reverse everything thinking, whatever comes between my data center and that user needs to optimize what they are doing. So that's one of the best practices that, that we started to see. And you know, we started to pivot, I guess we'll, we'll continue using that word, right? We started to pivot from, from just providing connectivity within our buildings to really understanding that we are a vital component in that user's education. Um, for for the other one, it's just to understand, and then you use the word inclusive, that any solution really has to do the same for whoever is in my attendance zones. Um, we've used the analogy of, of a track meet, right? I'll always have the disclosure that I never ran track and, and never really had any motivation to run to do anything. But um, when you see the staggered starting lines, that became a best practice for us, right? Equity means not everybody starts at the same line, but it meant for us as we recover from this, that we do have staggered starting lines. And we do understand that some of our community of learners is going to need very different supports than, than on the other side, right? And, and we're not as expansive in a geographical area, but we are expansive in the social capital provided to our kids and in what they have access to. So I guess the best practice for us is being cognizant of that and understanding that we need to account for that starting line. Some great advice, Dr. Rico. Thank you so much. And Michelle, what practical tips can you offer folks on distance learning um, with WebEx? Definitely. Um, you know, the, the one thing that I would say is that we learned this year is that training is the, the foundation of success for our teachers. So giving them the chance to think collectively with their peers on how uh, how WebEx is, is going to help them create what I, you know, what I said earlier, that that community that is part of, of teaching, um, but also recognizing that that training is ongoing. Uh, that, that as we started, it was really about here's how you turn it on and here's how you mute and here's how you unmute that we always forget to do. Uh, but it was also thinking about as they got more refined and more expert in their practice with WebEx, how can we then take it to the next level and watching uh, like our music teachers um, learn how to create virtual performances with their kids, uh, watching our, our, our language arts teachers use breakout rooms to have, um, you know, uh, small group book discussions uh, and then bringing those back together in a classroom, recognizing that all of the good practices uh, that they had learned in their classroom can be enhanced, not just while we're remote, but even when we come back in person uh, in ways that they never imagined, and then to help encouraging them to find those practices and share them with one another, um, I think is, is the tip that I would give. Don't stop. Uh, just because we're coming back in person, uh, don't stop using these tools to, to enhance learning for your kids. And this question goes to both of you now. So given our experiences collectively over the past year, I think we all know that there are some school districts who continue to struggle. And so what advice would you offer to folks who even still now feel like they are struggling, needing some help with closing that digital divide and distance learning? Dr. Rico? So, the digital divide for us is very present in the sense that, you know, it's now being recognized from the state and the national level. So we're starting to see our community with the influx of dollars that, that, that are coming in to be able to, to close that gap for our kids. So it, it for us, 
we can see the light at the end of the tunnel, you know, and then, and, and um, what was the first part of your, of your question again, Tony? Sorry. So it's giving your experience last year, what, what actionable tips and like what advice can you provide for folks who even now are still struggling to close that digital divide? Yeah. So, so, and then, then, and continuing on that, there's more money available out there now. And there is now more technical expertise available, right? I think everybody started mobilizing at the time at the time that the pandemic hit to really provide solutions. And um, if if I could give you any tip, as with anything, right? And and I think we all, uh, all of us that deal with vendors, know that there's some really good vendors and some really ethical vendors. And then there's the ones that that come out when the when the billions were announced for for connectivity, right? And and promise you the world and say they can. And you know, do everything for you, and then the next two weeks, as long as you sign out that PO. So really scope out who you're working with, and really look at who you trust, and then who's provided you with solutions in the past. For me, it was very difficult to take on that actionable step because I had no connections, right? So um, it was rather different when you're buying uh, workbooks and programs as a as a school principal than now looking for solutions here. So um, really look at whatever funding is available at your state and at the national level, and then really look at who you want to do business with. Um, at the end of the day, whatever solution we come up with cannot be a Band-Aid solution that is only going to help us navigate through through the now, and then magically everybody poofs and disappears when the two years of funding are gone and you can't sustain that solution and you can't really do anything with it. We've had a lot of experiences like that in education, right? Many of us have clickers from whatever vendor you can see that when funding was available everything worked and then all of a sudden now you're left on your own so the actionable steps i would think of is just be cognizant of those realities thank you and michelle we're going to give you the last minute before we close <laughs> well you know I, i'm going to build on what dr rico said because i think you know we've all heard the the phrase what's the best time to plant a tree 50 years ago, what's the second best time? It's today. And we have a unique opportunity right now to think of today as a chance to build that future that we want for our kids. Uh, and the one tip that I would give is when you think about um, how you do that, many um, districts go out to their community with a handout. Um, help them see that you're giving them a leg up. When we provide opportunities for our kids, it helps the economic uh, outcomes of our community. Um, it helps us make sure that we're building the future that we're going to need to keep our community strong. Um, and by building those relationships with the right uh, mindset, you're going to see your community really lean in to making sure that this doesn't just end when, when the funding ends. That's amazing. Making sure it doesn't just end and trust. So important. Thank you, Michelle Bourgeois, Oscar Rico. We appreciate your time, and Heather is going to close us out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, awesome. So we really appreciate you joining this session at ISSI today. Um, we will be posting the recording um, in 24 to 48 hours. So if you want to share this with any of your colleagues or we listen to anything, please check it out. Um, <clears throat> Also, uh, we'll try to get a copy of the presentation uploaded to the digital tote bag. I don't believe it's there right now, so we'll work on that. Um, additionally, if you wanna pull up your phone and grab this QR code, we have some additional information on our microsite to help you um, learn a little, bit, a little bit more about what Cisco is doing uh, with education. And then um, we encourage you to check out our virtual booth. We have a really great video on there um, with Chris Martin. He's uh, singing his song, Yellow, which I'm sure many of you have heard. Um, as well as check out some of our resources there. So we'd love for you to stop by. And um, Suzanne did talk about this earlier, but we do have more sessions coming up today and a couple tomorrow. So, um, you know, please, please join us. Your schedule permits. Um, I know there's so many sessions happening at ISTE, so we just really appreciate you being here today with us and, and spending the time. So we're going to close out the session. I hope you have a great rest of your week and um, we'll talk soon. Take care, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you guys.